I think as a scientist, one of the problems that we have is getting people to understand the type of work that we do. Sometimes people think that when you work in a lab, it's very complicated or they don't understand or it's very, very difficult to understand. So I think having this kind of conference helps us to explain the, the reason why we do what we do and how it can be easily understood. It doesn't always have to be very, very complicated. So I think if we can explain the work we do better, then I think people will realize how important scientific research is. just give you a very general background about how biology works, what do genes and proteins and cells and tissues mean and what, how things are happening. And then I will go into a little, little more detail of a few examples. If you zoom in a little more, we can see that every organ is made up of a number of different types of cells. Essentially, there are four different types. You have cells that work to hold everything together. We have epithelial cells. These work essentially to give structure to the body. If we zoom in a little more again and look at these different types of cells, maybe from your biology book, you recognize a, a cell. So essentially every organ is made up of individual cells. No matter what the function of the cell is, it has the same components. It has lots of different internal components that are all working together to keep the cell doing what it's supposed to do. So as you can imagine, there are millions and millions of cells communicating and working together to make up the body. It's an extremely complex system. So if we look within the nucleus of the cell, we have the DNA. The DNA is essentially the, the textbook that tells what cells will do, what they're supposed to make, how they're supposed to move, how they're supposed to behave. It provides the instruction for everything within our body. As an example, we can see how the strand of DNA is making up individual genes. Each gene has its own job. Just to go through a couple of examples, we have some genes that have a particular sequence and by reading this sequence, what happens is they make proteins. And one protein has a job to do within the cell. So what are the proteins? So just to give you an example, one might be something like insulin, uh, a hormone that regulates growth and proliferation. Use sugar for energy. It's produced by your pancreas and circulates in the body. If you don't have it, you have diabetes. So each circle represents a protein within a cell. One protein is not just going to do one thing. One protein will interact with many others at different times and in different pathways. And it's very complex, as you can imagine. We want to know what protein or what, what genes are gone wrong or not working well in cancer. For example, here are three different, three different genes. One is called P53, one is called RAS, and one is called MIC. And we know from many, many years of research that between a normal tissue and a lung here that has metastatic cancer, cancer that has spread and has infiltrated the lung, these genes and proteins are expressed differently. We know, for example, that P53 is frequently missing in cancer. Before we can start figuring out what they do in cancer, one of the things we have to figure out is what do they normally do. What happens is when there is DNA damage, the cell actually recognizes it. And this is the job of the P53 gene. It realizes there is DNA damage, and it comes to the DNA damage, and it fixes it. And this is the role of this protein. You can imagine that the repair processes that the cell has are very, they're actually very efficient. But then what happens if the wrong gene gets the DNA damage? What happens if it happens to be the P53 gene that gets DNA damage and loses its function? So what happens if we have no P53? Of course, nothing can come and repair the damage. If another bit of damage happens, this continues. 
and if another piece of damage happens, this continues. As I said, we know from lots of studies that within cancer, lots of genes are differently expressed. We know cancer loses p53. We know sometimes RAS is mutated. We know MYC sometimes is overexpressed. How do we figure out which one of these actually caused the cancer in the first place? We'll continue with p53 as an example. The work we do, essentially we use cells. We can grow cells in tissue culture and we can manipulate them to do different experiments. We can do the same in mice. We can change the number of genes. We can decrease them, we can increase them, we can have them there and not there and back on again or vice versa. This is how we figure out what a gene normally does. For example, mice have been made that have no growth hormone or have too much growth hormone. Growth hormone is hormone made during uh, when you're a teenager. It helps, helps the body mature. It helps everything grow and proliferate. When we made mice with extra copies, you can see the mice grow bigger. When they made mice with less growth hormone, they grow less. And by manipulating this in a mouse model, we actually help, we're, we're able to understand what this hormone normally does. This is not as complicated as it looks. What happens when we make a mouse with no p53? What this graph is, is called a survival curve. We basically take a large bunch of mice, a big group of mice with p53 and with no p53, and we watch them for 500 days, and if a mouse dies, we mark it on the graph. At the beginning, all of the mice are alive, 100%. And at the end of 500 days, the mice, the normal mice with P53 in the green line are still alive. Whereas the mice with no P53, they all start dying, one by one by one by one. After less than a year, all of the mice with P53 have died. All of the mice die from cancer. You can see here the other blue line is mice. Normally you have two copies of a gene. You can remove one or both. The mice that have lost one copy of P53, they also start dying. If you have no P53, it actually causes cancer. That was in mice. We can do the same thing in cells. We can remove P53 from cells that normally have it and look to see what happens. The cells with no P53, each black dot, represents a, a large group of cells that have grown up out of control. Essentially, having no p53 is causing the cells to proliferate much faster, whereas the, the normal cells should not grow. All of these cells have huge amounts of DNA damage. So p53 is normally repairing the damage and protecting from cancer. This is just a summary of p53 in human cancer. If we just look at the top line, it says ovary, and it goes all the way up to 50%. So 50% of cancer in the ovary has lost or mutated p53. What it doesn't show is that the cancers that don't have a mutation actually have something else preventing p53 from working. The majority, almost 100% of human cancers don't have p53 doing what it's supposed to do in one way or another. What happens if you have too much p53, then it must be fantastic. You're, you're not going to get cancer. Essentially, what happened is the mice with too much p53 did not do well either. This is another survival curve. Normal mice are in red. After three years, normal mice will start to die. In the blue line, the mice with extra p53 are still dying faster, but they don't have cancer. I told you p53 normally repairs DNA damage. What it does in repairing DNA damage is to stop the cell from proliferating. If there's too much damage, it will cause the cell to die. Get rid of the cell with the damage because it can't be repaired. If you put in too much p53, the cell thinks it has too much damage because p53 is doing too many things and we think it is killing the cells. The mouse dies looking like it has gotten old. If you don't have p53, you get cancer. But on the other hand, if you have too much p53, you get aging. I'm not going to go through this either, but this, this is just a little example of how p53 interacts with other proteins.
So these are all the other proteins that P53 is talking to, helping to repair DNA damage and help to keep the cell proliferating or telling the cell to stop because there's too much damage. And this is only one little part of it. There are a lot more. A few years ago, my former boss discovered a new gene, P63. And then they found another one, so they stuck with the pattern, and it was called P73. It turns out these three genes are part of a family. Given how important P53 is, we were interested in studying what does P63 do. Again, we used the mice. We put in too much P63, and we tried to see, well, what happens? We took the cells, put in too much P63, and put them into mice, and again, we we saw that the mice developed tumors. So again, we gave these tumors to the pathologist, and this time, the tumors were different. The cells with too much P63 formed a particular type of tumor called squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell essentially means it came from a cell, one of your organs. For example, in your skin, the cells at the top, at the very, very top of your skin, are called squames and carcinoma means it came from an epithelial tissue. What we are showing here is that by overexpressing this gene, we were able to cause this kind of tumor. Here you just have your nice diagram of a mouse, and then in green is a cross-section of the skin, and the little green circles are P63. So we're able to make the mouse where we can have a normal mouse. We turn off P63, and you can see essentially the green dots have gone away. When we removed P63 from the mice, these mice became old much faster. The two mice here are the same age, they're two brothers, and one has P63 and one doesn't. So obviously keeping everything in the right balance is necessary. If things get mixed up, if we have too little P53, it can lead to cancer. If we have too much P63, it can also lead to cancer. Whereas the other way around, having too much P53 or too little P63 can actually cause aging. What we're doing is trying to figure out the next step and the next step as to how each one can cause or keep a cancer growing. Thank you.